Okay, welcome everybody. I have another special guest with me today, uh, Nadia Moreau, who is a nuclear physicist, a business owner. Uh, she's on the board of the NCGR, and she's going to be speaking uh, at the NCGR conference February 2017 uh, on the physics of astrology. And her website is physicsofastrology.com. So I'd like to welcome you, Nadia. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you, Brian. It's my pleasure. Yeah, so I really found your, your website interesting when I discovered it because I've always had a fascination um, about the actual physical thing that's going on uh, with astrology to make it work. And I know that's a, a passion of yours, correct? Yes, absolutely. Uh, as a former physicist, uh, a former nuclear physicist, I would say, um, I always thought that it's my business to explain astrology from the scientific standpoint uh, I was surrounded by skeptics all my life. They are my friends. They're my former colleagues. And when they would learn that I do astrology, they would ask me, like, how can you believe in astrology if you're a scientist? Mm -hmm. And I would say, well, how can I not believe it if it works? You know? And they would say, how does it work? You know, the Mercury is all the way up there, or the moon is all the way up there, and I'm all the way down here. And I make my own decisions. I'm my own man. So explain to me how, how that works. And when I was young, when I just graduated at that time, I just didn't know how to explain. I just knew that it works. But I didn't know how to explain. But I thought, you know, I have to find the answer because, you know, they're not going to let me alone. <laughs> they're not going to let me be because they're going to, my friends are going to be always with me and they're always going to question that. So eventually... I, I found a very simple explanation and it was, it's literally so obvious that, you know, how did we miss it all mm -hmm. along? And these days I can take on, uh, I would say, any skeptic who is scientifically minded. And there are different types of skeptics. Uh, one type of skeptic is somebody who is fairly scientific or prides themselves at being logical. Um, then they're be very easy to convince and convert to kind of understand that astrology has validity. And another type of skeptic is somebody who not very scientific, but very rigid, and they would uh, just say, uh, I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to know about it. It's, it's uh, BS, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want you to say anything. I don't want to talk about it. So those are like, there's nothing you can do about that. All right. So, but scientific uh, ones, uh, logical ones, they're very, very good at processing what I have to say. Okay. And these days I can uh, give them an explanation in one sentence or I could talk all day. Right. Well, I know, I know that your, your website has a lot of information on it about um, what you've discovered and how you approach the work. Um, and we only have a half hour, so we can't go all day. But, <laughs> but you know, when you're thinking about it um, and, and you meet someone who has questions about how astrology works, what is kind of the first, what is your lead in? What is the thing that, that you're able to really describe to the mind? If we look at this, this can help us understand how astrology works. Well, uh, then I'm going to give you one sentence. Okay. Usually when they ask me, so how does it work? So I uh, ask them, well, you know the moon, right? Right. Uh, well, have you heard of moon tides? Mm -hmm. And that's when they start thinking, okay, tides. Oh, okay, yeah, I've heard of moon tides. Yes, it has to do with gravity. Yes, that's, that's cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. So moon affects uh, oceans with its gravity. So creating tides. Now, scientists also uh, discovered that there are tides in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And since gravity affects everything, tides would be everywhere. T tides would affect everything. And mm -hmm. humans consist of mostly liquids and water. Brain consists of 78% of water. Why wouldn't be we affected by those gravitational tides, mm -hmm. right? And if moon affects us with its tides, with, with gravity, then why wouldn't other planets uh, have an effect on us? Mm -hmm. And that's easy. And then skeptics would say, yeah, yeah, come to think of it, you're right. But the next question would be, but how does it actually work? Right. 
So from that point, we can talk all day. Well, let's just <laughs> where, where would you go next with that, though? You know, so uh, once well, we talk about the moon, that makes perfect right. sense. Yes. Yeah, so the next I would talk about gravitational waves that are created by all the planets. And the waves have their quality. Like they have frequency, they have wavelengths, they have an amplitude, they have a power to the wave, and they have also a direction. Each wave, if you look at the ocean, has a direction. It has an amplitude, it has a frequency, and none of those uh, frequencies and amplitudes are the same. They change constantly, right. uh, just like in the ocean. Um, and so what we are is we are a tiny small entities boats who live in a big ocean of gravitational waves mm -hmm. and if you heard of um, um super fluid universe concept i have not but it sounds fancy all right so <laughs> um well just in in couple of words yes. in, in traditional nuclear physics we always worked with uh, vacuum okay which, which uh, in that concept and that model, and that's a model, it's not proven, it's a model. In that model, vacuum is just an em emptiness and nothingness, right? Nevertheless, we assume that um, waves propagate through vacuum, like, you know, gravity waves or you know, light propagates through vacuum. How can it propagate if it's uh, emptiness or nothingness, right? right? And that always was strange to me back when I was studying uh, nuclear physics. It was like, it didn't make sense to me. Um, but Tesla back in the day, he never used the word vacuum. As a matter of fact, Tesla was working with the concept of ether. Mm. Ether, which is not a vacuum, but a medium. Right. And that ether has a, sort of like a liquid uh, texture or liquid, um, fluid um, uh, uh, quality to it. Mm -hmm. And if we assume that we live not in a vacuum, not in emptiness, but in the ether, right, then all the rest makes sense. Right. It's like we live in the ocean, mm -hmm. but different kind. So all those planets, they're making gravitational waves. Yes. And we, we can think of them similar to like waves on water. Exactly. exactly. And, and all those different planets with their, their patterns and their vibration, how they cross over or how those waves cross over and the, the patterns they make, that's what gives us the, the experience that we have uh, from an astrological perspective. Is that correct? Exactly. One other thing I have to say, as we do have very little time, is that uh, another easy way to look at it is um, that humans are antennas. Okay. So uh, imagine radio. Mm -hmm. uh, antenna gets bombarded by all sorts of waves that come in from outside of such a humongous spectrum of frequencies right. that you know there is no limit to the amount of frequencies. And frequencies could be high frequencies, low frequencies of the whole spectrum mm -hmm. from you know uh, wide, very broad spectrum. And what the radio does, the radio has an amplifier that you can tune into only certain selected frequencies that you want. Right. And the amplifier is essentially a Tesla coil that you tune into resonate with one of the frequencies. Okay. And that resonance uh, makes one of the frequencies amplified to the point that you could hear something, the information delivered on that particular frequency. So humans are designed like a very, very sophisticated antennas where we get bombarded with the same exact broad spectrum of frequencies, mm -hmm. uh, just like antenna. Uh, and we have an internal amplifiers that amplify mostly uh, five radio stations for us. Pick out five radio stations. We have audio amplifier in our brain. We have... Uh, so we can capture certain range of audio frequencies. Uh, we have visual. We, we uh, capture certain range of visual frequencies. 
uh, then we have our skin that can process, uh, it's like an amplifier and processor of uh, infrared, UV uh, frequencies type. And then we have also nose and, and, a, and a tongue that kind of process some other information uh, with other frequencies. Right. And do, can we can we actually capture and process some other frequencies that are outside of those ranges? And some of us can, we call it sixth sense. Mm -hmm. um, we can actually tune in, not using the eyes, not using ears, not using any of these six, uh, five major sense. We can tune into something and process certain information that we call sixth sense. And that we can do that in a dream state we can do that during the meditation with all the senses we're trying to block them out all the senses we close our eyes we meditate we're trying to get some information that way so uh other animals or species have other stations that they can amplify outside of the range of humans mm -hmm. so that tells you that we only tuned into certain frequencies but the information is out there that we don't get consciously Right, but but we do get it subconsciously. Right. Well, with, with that idea, I mean, can you also take that that idea, uh, that metaphor from the, from the senses, but to also being able to be an antenna for the way we experience particular planetary energies? And that's what I yes, I was leading to. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Planets, just like everything else, um, they send us an information in the vibrational form. And they just have a very, very low frequencies. Like for example, Jupiter is 12 years um, per cycle. Mm -hmm. right? That's uh, Jupiter's frequency. And the moon is 28 days per cycle. That's the moon's frequency. Saturn is 29 years per cycle and so forth. So those are all um, broadcasting entities they broadcast information to us in those type, uh, type of low frequencies but those low frequencies can actually resonate in harmonics with the uh, higher frequencies but are harmonically fitting within those low frequencies so this is how we get to process it um, and our whole body is designed to process those frequencies on a, a subconscious level and the way you can kind of visualize it is if you imagine yourself on a small boat in the ocean right mm -hmm. if you get a radio signal that tells you okay you should um move that way right then okay you say okay i'm gonna move that way but then you might not get a radio signal but the big wave might come along a very very big wave comes along and you don't really consciously understand what's going on. The boat lifts up and the boat moves moves somewhere. You don't even know where it moves. Mm -hmm. But that wave essentially has a propagational direction, has a certain energy that it carries, and that energy and that direction pushes you a certain way, and there's nothing you can do about it. Right. <laughs> there's nothing you can do about it. The same thing with planets. Say Saturn returns and Saturn carries a humongous wave that has its own, it's a gravitational wave that affects our brain and it has its own direction. It has its own, um, you know, energy to it. Uh, and it takes you somewhere that you might not want to go to, but there's nothing you can do about it, just like on that boat. Right. And people ask me, well, how does Mercury retrograde works? And um, I had a, I did a lecture at, at, uh, at the sailors club. So those are all old sailors. They were very curious. They kind of understood the concept of the ocean and the radio because they're very much familiar with that. Mm -hmm. But they asked me, so how does Mercury retrograde works? And I, I told them, well, imagine yourself on a boat on the tip of the wave that the boat is riding. And then imagine that wave is going one direction, then the wave, stops and turns the other direction and this is a powerful wave so your boat will go in a direction that the wave turns right. because the boat has no other choice the boat rides in that wave so with the mercury retrograde 
you ride in one way, then you turn around and you ride in backwards, sort of. Mm -hmm. Well, well can I interrupt for just a moment? Um, one, one question I'm curious about with that is um, uh, with, with retrograde planets uh, from a Vedic perspective, the way they're, they're considered so powerful because typically they're going to be moving stationary, like you're talking about as the waves moving stationary, and then they're moving backwards as you're discussing. But they're also, the planets are as close to the Earth as they're going to get. Is that, is that correct? And, right. and does that amplify it as well? From that, that's another good point, yeah. that the closer the celestial body is to Earth, the more powerful gravitational wave it brings. Right. This is why the moon is so important to study and learn because the moon is essentially is a massive amplifier of and massive filter for all the other information that comes to us through other from other planets. And the moon is also comes closer to Earth and comes further away, goes further away from Earth, and Every time when it's closer, it's more powerful. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same thing with planets. Every time they get closer, which is in a retrograde motion, they get very, very powerful. You feel them. Right. Um, it, it's like you feel like the current takes you. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing you can do about it. You, if you resist, you're literally wasting your energy. Right. Relax and enjoy the ride. Right. Well, with that, with the moon, you mentioned that the moon is very important because it's closer to the earth and it helps to interpret how a lot of those energies are, are impacting us. Right. 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 Well, in Vedic astrology, the moon is very important because it, it can represent our character. It can represent how we, how we react to the things that happen to us. So we look at the ascendant as what happens, like the actual events, and the moon as the individual that kind of perceives those events. So how do you, is that something similar or do you look that, at... That is very cool. That was my question to you because okay. I read recently that the moon in Vedic astrology is responsible for the brain activity. Mm. And yeah. in Western astrology, people don't really talk much about the moon responsible for the brain activity. They talk about Mercury responsible for the brain activity. Right. But I find that the moon is very much powerfully affecting our brain, you know, because... It affects our desires, emotion, and we act and process information based on our emotional state. Mm -hmm. If we're happy, you know, we make decisions based on our happy state of mind. If we're unhappy, we would refuse to do certain things. That, that's exactly right. You know, and that's why the moon is so... The moon... Okay, so in Vedic astrology, they have an idea of um, um, planets having friendship with each other or not. And so the moon has no enemies. It's the only planet that has no enemies. And that's because they say that the moon will adapt to whatever influence it's being impacted by. So if it's being impacted by Saturn and there's depression or only seeing, you know, what can go wrong and these sorts of things, the moon will still survive and adapt to that. Or if there's Jupiter, where there's a great sense of joy and, and uh, inner peace and wisdom, the moon will adapt to that. But never is the moon in a state where it's actually getting hurt by uh, as far as having an enemy from other planets. Right? I love that angle. I love mm -hmm. what you just said. I've been thinking about moon a lot. As a matter of fact, I'm working on an article about the moon uh -huh. and uh, to um, um, basically to study the moon from the standpoint of both science, mm -hmm. history, uh, astrology, and maybe a little conspiracy also. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> uh, because the moon is the closest celestial body to Earth, and we don't know where it came from. And right. it's much older than Earth, and it's on a very unusual orbit for a satellite and so forth. But um, astrologically and from standpoint of physics, the moon essentially is a massive filter just like in the radio um, it's a massive filter and amplifier mm -hmm. so what I mean by that say for example Venus Venus is sending us a vibrational information say Venus wants to say something to us right and uh, what the moon does the moon uh, amplifies that particular message mm -hmm. and filters out something that um, whatever so the moon right. has an ability to amplify it with its gravity mm -hmm. and sends us a much amplified message 
from the uh, from the Venus, but based on the angles and positions, it's going to be sort of not a direct message from the Venus, but kind of sort of twisted and processed right. uh, through the Moon. And the way it works from physics standpoint is uh, each celestial body with its gravity bends the light. We know that, right? Mm -hmm. We know that the Sun bends the light coming from stars. We know that any planet that uh, with its gravity bends the light. Gravity bends the light. We know that from the times of Einstein. So, um, in that respect, the gravity not just going to bend the light, it's going to bend any wave right. that has any energy and, you know, any frequency, any amplitude to it. So, the gravity of one planet is going to bend a gravitational message from another planet, of course. Bending means it's going to be the same thing as if we trying to see through the magnifying glass or we put the magnifying glass in front of the sun and the magnifying glass is going to bend that light from the sun and focus it on an object and can burn something that you put underneath, like a paper towel you put underneath of the magnifying glass, it's going to burn it, which means it focuses the light from the sun and amplifies it by means of bending it within a glass. So it's along those lines. So the moon essentially it's round. So it's gonna bend the light from both ends and it's gonna focus that light on us. So mm -hmm. this is how it, uh, one of the images, um, how it actually physically amplifies this light by, mm -hmm. by kind of focusing it by its own gravity. Um, so the moon, as you're saying, adapting to each planet. Essentially, being a, being a messenger and amplifier, that's what it actually does. It amplifies and transmits the messages from other planets to us. Therefore, it adapts each message to us. It's a, it's, it, it is a messenger. Right. Well, with, with, that, with that same idea, let me know if this uh, fits with what you're describing. Um, so we'll often look at... Uh, the ascendant, we'll look at a chart from the ascendant and, and we'll get an, a sense of, you know, what is this person's life direction going to be like from the ascendant? Cause that changes every two hours or so on average. But then what we would also do is we'd look to the moon and we'd make the moon an ascendant by itself. And we would, we would read a chart from there to see, is there any similar um, patterns? Because when we see a pattern from the ascendant and also a pattern from the moon and it overlaps, from the, the Vedic perspective, that would tell us that's a more uh, potent karma or, or more potent experience that you're more likely to experience because you see it from one angle and you also see it from the angle of the moon. Is this similar to what you're, you're discussing or am I taking it out of context here? No, 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 that's a very good concept. And with astrology, uh, from what I noticed also, no matter how you twist the chart and how you lay one chart on top of another, everything always works. Okay. Uh, and it just gives you a different type of angles to look at. Right. And uh, putting the moon on the ascendant and looking at it from that perspective, mm -hmm. or, or even doing a solar chart like in Western astrology, it just uh, gives you answers from a different angle. Okay. And, but I would say looking at the moon, putting the moon on the ascendant, should be a powerful type of reading. Mm -hmm. um, because the moon is the closest celestial body and has the most massive influence on us. Right. There are astrologers who just study sun and moon position, and that's all they do, and they do all their readings based on that. And right. um, you know, we live in these waves of full moon, new moon, kind of like we're going through it every month. For sure. How do you, I mean, this might be taking you in a direction you don't necessarily want to go, but I'm curious about uh, the, the north node of the moon and the south node of the moon, or we call them Rahu and Ketu. Um, based on how th those patterns that those planets make, um, how do they affect the waves if, if you're looking at it that way? Because they seem to distort them from, you know, the perspective I've seen. But. Right. So those are sensitive points as they're um, uh, not an actual celestial bodies, but sensitive points where um, that they create sort of, I would say, um, imprint, right? People call them imprint. 
um, I had a question. Uh, somebody wrote to my website. I have I have some people who find my website and they write interesting questions. So one person wrote a question uh, about uh, uh, her, him or her. I don't remember noticing that there is a planetary memory. A planet has gone through a certain point, and that point stays very much sensitive. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are many, many sensitive points that we know of, like um, uh, eclipses, mm -hmm. and also Rahu and Ketu, sort of like uh, sensitive points, like a memory where the moon have been or will be next time, and they are like vortexes. We should talk about vortexes a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Tell me <Yeah>. about. It. <laughs> Yeah, the vortex comes uh, comes in uh, once we talk about gravity. That's when that word you're gonna hear that uh, going further because people don't know much about gravity except for this is what they heard from school that gravity is invented by Newton and it's a force. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, gravity has been looked at from different angles, and yes, there's, it's a force by Newton, but it's also a curvature of space by Einstein. But essentially, since we live in a dynamic world, and Tesla has been saying that, you know, when you think of life, think of vibration um, and movement, constant movement. Nothing is steady. Nothing is imprinted in stone. Uh, so essentially, uh, there is uh, this um, very interesting uh, person in the conspiracy world, but he's also well known in the conventional sciences by now. His name is Nassim Haramein. Um, this is for people to do their further research. A very interesting man. Mm -hmm. He, um, he uh, created a model which I strongly believe that this is what's going on. Gravity is essentially a vortex. A vortex in that superfluid universe, in that ether. Um, vortex has both force and curvature of space. So it's combination of Newton force and curvature of space by Einstein. So it's a vortex. It's just the same as uh, when you, you know, flush on your toilet and you see that vortex and <laughs> water going down. Right. That's exactly what gravity is. And every time that a planet moves around, it is, has its own vortex that it's creating, uh, its own gravity. And every time it uh, passes certain, it, cre it makes a certain um, alignments or certain, it goes through certain uh, sensitive points, um, it has um, a distortion of that vortex and sort of leaving an imprint mm -hmm. in that liquid. In that, um, essentially, uh, we have to talk about one more thing before we understand how this whole thing works and how we have the planetary memory of certain sensitive points. Is uh, there is one other thing in uh, uh, conventional science that has been um, brought to the attention of scientists in the beginning of the past century, and it's called. Um, uh, quantum entanglement mm -hmm. and quantum entang entanglement uh, uh, Einstein called it a spooky action at a distance quantum entanglement means that two particles uh, are entangled together in the universe it doesn't matter how far they are from each other but if you affect one the other one gets affected as well and simultaneously at the same moment. So the quantum entanglement essentially explains psychic phenomena, essentially explains a lot of things, and it defies the speed of light. Because it's instant, right? <laughs> because it's instant. That, that's it. That's it. This is why um, Einstein called it a paradox. And if you think of in terms of quantum entanglement, if you think in that particular uh, way, if you just remember that we're all entangled and no matter how far we are from each other, uh, we are entangled that if one gets affected, the other one gets affected, but we all living in this one big ocean 
uh, in one big dance of the planets. So each point that the planet is going to go through will affect you. But if that planet uh, creates a dramatic kind of passage through, say, like moon uh, gets to its sensitive point, which is Rahu and Ketu, north, mm -hmm. north, south, so it gets to its sensitive point, it's a dramatic spot in that passage of the moon. So every spot that creates more drama is going to be more memorable to you. It's just like in your own human life. Uh, if you go back in, in the memory, the only things that you remember in your life, you can't, you can't possibly remember every second of your day right. for the past like 30, 40, whatever, 50 years that you live. Uh, the only things that you remember clearly are the moments that are very, very dramatic, right? Mm -hmm. So this is where planetary um, memory comes in, is when a, when a moon goes through a dramatic moment or any other planet goes through a dramatic moment. So that particular dramatic moment is entangled with us and our um, body will have a subconscious dramatic memory of that particular moment and it will affect us. Consciously, we can't really process it unless we are very much into astrology. Then that gives us an opportunity to consciously process what just happened. Right. But people who are not, they don't know what exactly just happened. They just know something happened and it's dramatic. Right. So we live in this world of where we have moments where we have least drama, when there is a smooth sailing of uh, the moon through a certain part of the sky, then the moon hits the spot where it creates drama and our body sort of have this uh, surge of drama, right? Then the moon, moon goes away from that and we remember that drama, right? And other planets will remember that drama. Each dramatic moment will be remembered just like we remember um, you know, water has memory. There are scientific studies these days uh, that, you know, they all talk about structure of water, how you can create memory um, in the water. You know, crystals, you know, you freeze water that's been uh, sitting next to crystal. It's going to be different than the water that's just you get from the sink and so forth. So water is very much understudied medium mm -hmm. it's very hard to study water um but it, it has a, it's gotten a lot of attention as of recently by a lot of scientists and we are mostly liquid even mm -hmm. our bones have 22 percent of water you know, everything every inch of our body gets that from the planets gets that those messages and you can resist that so then, so then our experiences and our sense of self and all these things, really what it is is you can imagine it maybe like a temporal or mm, uh, crystallized uh, uh, experience of just how all the planets are, are coming together and where those vectors are hitting. and Exactly. That's, yeah. that's what's creating the patterns for us. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, okay. yeah, it's a uh, wee tiny little, you know, bubbles, entities. Right in a big ocean uh, where waves takes us somewhere and we just trying to understand where it's taken us. Right. Um, and um, Nassim Harmain, I mentioned, uh, he talks about a universe being self-aware. Mm -hmm. And um, for those who are interested to research further, uh, just go and uh, Google Nassim Harmain Mm -hmm. and he uh, has a bunch of lectures and videos online, he talks about the whole universe being self-aware, not just us humans being self-aware, right? But, you know, the tree could be self-aware. Okay. Right. Water is self-aware. Yeah. Uh, uh, when I'm going to do a lecture at the conference, I already done a similar type of lecture recently, but when I'm going to do a lecture at the conference, I'm going to show a lot of, video demonstrations that will show people how exactly water gets affected by different vibrations right. what happens to water they're so impressive that once you see that 
you it's going to create a dramatic imprint in your brain and you're going to understand instantly how things work right right yes and that's at the the ncgr conference in february in baltimore correct yes and yes. it's a wonderful conference that's coming up uh, we have uh, many many famous uh, great speakers um, uh, and to name a few, there's Rob Hand, uh, Joyce Levine, and Ronnie Dreyer, mm -hmm. and um, Arlene Niemark, Joanne Castro, and, and myself, and um, many other wonderful speakers. And uh, they gonna bring a lot to, um, to the table. Mm -hmm. uh, most interesting subjects that I find are Financial astrology. There are a couple of lectures going to be um, doing lectures on financial astrology. There's also um, Rob Hand is going to talk about new light on essential dignities. I can talk on and on and on about yes. who is who and what is what, but the website to go to is NCGR Conference 2017.com. Uh -huh. And um, there's going to be also uh, a dinner with dancing. I, I know a lot of people like that. <laughs> <laughs> there's, uh, there's also going to be uh, pre-conference and post-conference workshops. Um, and there's also going to be a, an exam for certification. Okay. Astrologers. Well, the most exciting one I would think is going to be yours. In fact, I kind of wish we had more time because uh, you've started so many questions for me. So maybe if you're up for it, we could maybe do a few other talks. Uh, I, I would love that. And um, thank you so much. I'm very flattered that you said that my speech is the most exciting. <laughs> it well, is most exciting to me too. Uh, but yeah, nobody knows me that much yet. Well, that they, they should. I mean, because per personally as an astrologer, you know, part of my story is that I've always been skeptical of astrology. And, and even to this day, every time I, like I do a lot of charts and every time it works, I'm like, wow, look at that. <laughs> You know, skepticism, even though my life is about uh, arguing with skeptics and debating with them, uh, skepticism is a very, very healthy thing. I started in astrology as a skeptic myself also. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of rules in Western astrology, things you shouldn't or sh should or should not do. Like right. For example, uh, you cannot ask the same question in horary astrology um within three months like mm. you asked it and then you can't ask it again within three months i remember that and i thought no you know i'm all about i'm a scientist i'm all about experiment i'm gonna experiment and i did what i had to do i asked the same question like five times a day at least i wanted to yeah but what i realized is that sometimes i would even try to trick the astrology and right. I, I would get a positive answer to my question then I would think okay tomorrow moon is going to be a different position and I would elect the time when I'm going to come back to my computer and ask the same question when the moon should give me a negative answer yeah. See how that works and you know what would happen what I would forget to do that. Yes. <laughs> Next time I remember to ask a question, it gives me a positive answer again. And I'm right. like, damn, I can't really. Then I realized uh, that alone made me realize back then as a young scientist is that I'm not in control. For sure. That's what, that's what astrology teaches you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm curious about life. Right. I love it, but I'm not really that much in control of one and when I, I do things. Right. Yeah. And uh, that was very powerful discovery for me, try to experiment with astrology. But I have had a lot of skepticism while learning it. So I had to prove for myself everything that they say in a book that it works. Right. And I did. And this is how I uh, work with skeptics as well you know i asked them all right if you don't believe it you know let's uh, look at it let's uh, play with it right well, well personally you know it should make one a better astrologer because then you're actually analyzing things and you will find out for yourself this works or well that's just folklore it doesn't work at all you know and you're, you're able to separate out those things so but anyway i totally agree with you yeah. you've, you've got you've got so many questions going on in my mind so 
I'm going to write them down this evening and send them to you, and hopefully we can do another video soon. Excellent. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and thank you so much for being here with us today. And thank you. Thank you, Brian. Bye. Bye.